Okay, Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Good evening to another wonderful, beautiful class given by the, put together by the JLI, Jewish Learning Institute, as we go into the Yontiv of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, the holiday of Yom, the Yontiv of Yom Kippur, the fast day of Yom Kippur. So it's a beautiful class. It's a, whether a class, it's a class, uh, whether you're going to be staying home or you're going to be coming to show. It basically goes over the basic principles of Yontiv and the deeper meanings uh, to understand what we're trying to accomplish here in the Yontiv. It's, a, it's a very, should we go pretty quick? Should be a 45 minute class and gives you the basic understanding of the Yontiv. So I'm gonna share the screen with, the, with you. I'm gonna share the, uh, the PowerPoint with you and uh, you'll be able to uh, follow with that. And let's just start. The five things that this coming uh, Sunday night starts Yom Kippur. It's a day of fast day. Uh, we, the Torah says, we need to miss Shechem. You shall, uh, you shall bring to yourself a little bit of a comfort. And um, it's a day of, uh, of forgiveness. Day to the time where the Abish God forgives the Jewish nation. So basically, there are five restrictions to that day. We uh, don't eat and drink, is often understood. We don't bathe. We don't apply any ointments uh, from Sunday night to Monday night. We don't wear any leather shoes. And uh, engaging in marriage relationship, that is basic, the five things that is prohibited on, uh, on Yom Kippur. And Kippur is called Shabbos Shabbosim. It's in the Torah, it's called a Shabbos of Shabbos. So in essence, it's like a Shabbos. And therefore, whatever is prohibited on Shabbos is also prohibited on Yom Kippur. Uh, so all the prohibition of Shabbos that uh, you're not allowed to do on Shabbos, any kind of work, uh, electric, or any kind of things that you're prohibited to do on Shabbos, you're not allowed to do on Yom Kippur. Uh, carrying, if there's no aid of, all the things that are that are that are that are, that, are, that are you're not allowed to do on a, on a regular uh, Shabbos, you're not allowed to do on the Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a day that started off all the way back in history. This uh, the, the Yom Kippur started off in the time when the Jewish people were in the desert, and they received the Torah. And after they received the Torah, we all know the story of the making of the golden calf, where the Jewish people made the golden calf. And because they made the golden calf, God will want to uh, wipe them out, as the Torah says. And Moses prayed for the Jewish people. He went up another, he was up there 40 days and 40 nights, and he, he went up another 40 days and 40 nights. Ultimately, he went up uh, the third times of 40 days and 40 nights. He went up on his Elul, the first day of Elul, and he came down on the 10th day of Tishrei. On that day, <clears throat> which was the 40th day, the last time, the last, the last, the last set of 40 days, is when God said, Salachti Kidvarecha. Salachti Kidvarecha should be a word we all know because we always say it in Slichas for, for the last couple of days, and the Spidem have said it for the last month. Hashem Salachti God says, I forgive you. And we're going to say this in your Machzer. You're going to say this in the mother night, the night, Sunday night. You're going to repeat this over and over and over again. Salach tikidvarecha, where God said, I have forgiven you. And then the Torah itself says that <coughs> the day of Yom Kippur, the day where God says, I'm Yom Kapora. It's a day where God forgives a person from his Avedas, from his sins. Well, we all know that God should, should forgive somebody from your sins, you need to do tshuva. You need to repent. You need to, uh, to, to, be, to, to do tshuva. That means tshuva, the aspect of repentance, is something you can do a whole year. You should do every day. We actually do every day in our davening. We do, uh, uh, we do vidu. We do, we do, our, we do, we, we do our chet. We ask God for forgiveness. Hashamnu, bagadnu. We, we hit our hearts and we express our, 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 our sadness. But we know these days are called also a Sereseme Tshuva. These days are called the 10 days of repentance. So these days are set up. They're set up to begin with 
that it's a days where God has the 13 principles of mercy, continuation of Elul, where God is open, as we say in our davening, Hashem be search God when he is found, call him when he is around, and these are the days when God is waiting for the Jewish person, for humanity to repent. As we said, God, in essence, decide, written, wrote already on Rosh Hashanah. So they say the court of the court of justice in Lavail above already established on Rosh Hashanah what will be, but it gives you another couple of days, that's not a nine days until Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur, Yechasemu. Yom Kippur is the date of the signing of the decree. So the Abishtig opens the door, opens the door for the next couple of days. And as long as we take the opening of the door and we let ourselves in, then we have accomplished our status mechuva. We've accomplished the 10 days of repentance. Now we all know that the, that the, the, the culmination of the day of repentance is Ni'ila, is called Ni'ila. It's a prayer of Ni'ila. And the ila means the closing of the doors. The ila means to close. <laughs> so it's the ila. It's a dying, the door closes. These opening of the door, where God opens the door to the Jewish people so that they can have an opening for tshuva, comes to a close on the ila service of Yom Kippur. So it's very important these days to do tshuva. Now, most people think that tshuva is the meaning of repentance, which is which it is, but really tshuva means to return. That's the real world of a, a tshuva. Tshuva means to return. That means that we need to. Re, that means as as, as the, we believe the Torah, Nessa says, every person is perfect. Every person has a godly soul. Chassidus teaches us, every person has a godly soul, and since every person has a godly soul. So every person, in essence, is pure. Therefore, he just needs to return. He needs to, we need, I need to return to my essence. I need to tshuva. Actually, the word tshuva comes from the word toshu hey, to return the letter hey. God's name, in Kabbalah, it's written that God's name is the, the tetragram, the, the, the name that we don't say is yud. K vav k, yud hey vav hey, the yud hey is the upper hey and the letter yud, and the vav hey is the lower hey, and the hey, the lower hey is the is the way God comes into the goof, the way God in his your neshama comes into your body, and that drags it to places, it so to say drags the hey away from its source, and we need to bring it back toshuv, bring back the hey to its to the big, to, to the hay, to the upper hay, and reconnect the two, the upper and the lower. We know that the uh, the letter Aleph, for example, in Kabbalah, the letter Aleph. If you look at the letter Aleph in Hebrew, it's a yud on top, a yud in the bottom, and a vav in between. The yud is the way the nesham is the mila, the way the soul is above. The yud lamata, the soul is below. And we need to bring them together. Actually, you look at the Aleph, you can look like the Yud and the above comes to be low, and the Yud, the, the, the bottom Yud goes to above, actually sticking upside down, it sticks upwards. But that's a whole different subject. But it basically is the concept of coming down, the Yud, Yud, Yud K, the upper He Yud and the He wants to come down, and the lower case, the Vav He wants to stay down, it, wants, it goes too far down. It goes away from its source. It has the capability to go away from its source. And therefore, we need, therefore, when, when that hay loses its connection, it can, God forbid, lose total direction. It can go, God forbid, not only to lose direction, lose purpose, it can connect, it can, be, it can do sins. It can do the opposite of what it's created for, the opposite of purpose, it can go against godliness. So we need to just return. We need to redirect. It's not totally a change of things. It's a concept of redirection. If we can redirect our, 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 our avoider, 
if we can redirect our purpose, we can come back to our original state. And our original state, we're all born as a child. We are all born as children when I have no sin. So we're all born perfect. <clears throat> and that's, the Chassidus says, is the most beautiful thing of tshuva. Tshuva is the most beautiful concept in the Torah. To do tshuva is to not only come back to where you are, but it actually strengthens everything and it awakens everything. It transforms everything. The power of tshuva is that it takes the negative it doesn't only get rid of the negative, according to Hasidut. It takes the negative and it makes it positive. And the Gemara even says that if we do tshuva in the ultimate way, because there's many levels in, in tshuva, if we ultimately do tshuva in its ultimate way, then we take everything that we have done negative and we transform it into a positive thing. Why? Because in essence, that shows that the negative was there for the positive. And that's the picture over here. The strongest part of the rope is the knot. So where it got knotted, this rope, this connection, where it got knotted, where this became an obstruction, if we can turn this obstruction into something positive, then every negative thing that we have done in life will become not only that it will become, it will disappear, but actually it will become a positive thing. It will strengthen everything that we have in life. And that's the beauty of tshuva. The, the Gemara says that the Avish, that God created tshuva the first thing before, the, before anything in the world. He created the concept of repentance. The power of repentance. It's a very important thing that we realize the aspect of repentance. The concept of not only repentance between each other, but the repentance between us and God and the repentance to forgive ourselves. We need to forgive one another. We need to forgive the Abishta and the Abishta needs to forgive us. And we need to forgive ourselves. The Alta Rebbe writes in Tanya, he says, we say every day that uh, we the prayer in, in the Shmon Nasser, every day we say, Chanun that God has unbelievable compassion that he always forgives. That means when I say the blessing and I say God's name, I have to believe that he has forgiven me. Because if I don't believe that he has forgiven me, then I'm saying God's name in vain. So I have to believe that God has forgiven me. And why is it important that I believe that a God has forgiven me? So then I have to let go. I got to let go of the past. We as humans struggle of letting go of, of the past history, of our history, even our negative history. We have to let it go. If the Abish forgave us, then it's gone. The Torah says you're not allowed to, to uh, tell a person his previous sins. You're not allowed to tell a person his previous sins. So therefore, it's important to ask one another forgiveness. It's important to forgive. Because if we forgive, then God forgives us. So it's important for us to forgive. And it's important for us to ask forgiveness. And for surely it's important for us to ask forgiveness from God. One of the customs that we have is we do kaparot. Kaparot today is done with a chicken. Or with a fish or with money. You could, do it, you could do it with a chicken here in Florida, a private chicken, about a Coconut Creek, I believe, has a private, you can go there Thursday night. At Chabad, you can come to Chabad in the parking lot this year. We're going to do it outside. We're going to do kaparas, community kaparas. One chicken for all, one male chicken and one female chicken, one male chicken for all the men and one female chicken for all the, fem for all the women, and then we'll take it to someplace else to get it that importance, as we say, why do we do that? Because we say that it, that that let this chicken be slaughtered and we should go to a long life. I know it's a controversial thing, but
But it's a minig Yisrael, it's a custom by Jews for thousands of years since the destruction of the temple, which we cannot bring a sacrifice. And that's why we bring a chicken, because there was no sacrifice in the base of Mikdash that was a chicken. You could bring an animal, you could bring a dove, a, a bird, a dog, pigeon, but you could not bring a chicken. And that's why we bring a chicken today, specifically a chicken or a fish, because you can't bring a fish either in the temple. Those two animals were not brought as any sacrifice in the temple. It's a different, there's a reason why, but that's not for now. And the, 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 we use specifically a chicken to show that we're not trying to reenact the temple service. We're just doing a minag, a custom by Jews to, 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 to bring a chicken that anyway is going to be slaughtered one day to be used as food. And we're going to slaughter it. We take the chicken, we give it to the poor people. So it's totally surrounded with a, with, with a minag and also charity. One of the most important things on, on, on Erevim Kippur, this coming from Mate Shabbos till Sunday afternoon, is to give tzedakah. To give tzedakah as much as you can. Because we all know that the power of Dhaka, there's nothing more powerful than the concept of Dhaka. that once we give Dhaka, it transforms everything that we have done. Dhaka, Tatsal Mamavis, Dhaka has the power to transform and take away the negative. Sunday is a very special day. It's Erevim Kippur. Erevim Kippur, you have to have actually a feastful meal. Says you should eat on what you eat on Yom Kippur, Erev Yom Kippur is like fasting on Yom Kippur. So you're supposed to eat a festival, festival meal. First of all, that you should be able to have strength in Yom Kippur. We don't want you to be sick. I just want to tell you this year, due to the COVID situation, if you're not feeling well, you should ask a question if you should fast. There are a lot of ways that you don't have to fast. If it's going to be dangerous for you to uh, fast, Especially these days, you have a, you might if a doctor tells you surely you shouldn't fast, then it's questionable if you should fast. And you should ask to talk to a rabbi about it. But we have to be careful this year. Um, so if you are, you know, especially with the heat in Florida, it's important that you are careful. You don't get de dehydrated and you don't put yourself in any jeopardy. God forbid that you should put yourself in any jeopardy. Uh, with this fast day. It's not the point. The point of the fast is not to put a person in jeopardy, but a, to put a person in the mode of repentance. So we, 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 we have a festival meal. It gives you the, the reasons. We usually celebrate days of note in a festival meal. We eat this meal on Lenin and Kippur because the, of course we fast in Kippur. As much as our Father in Heaven wants us to fast, He doesn't want us to suffer. When we eat well on the day before the fast, our Father enjoys it as much as we fast. So it's a custom to eat and to eat more on Erev and Kippur than, than any other day. Beginning on Kippur, there's a day earlier demonstrates our eager participation of atonement, which itself is meritorious. So if we're eating for the, for the concept of fasting, that already shows, that's already connected to the aspect of, 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 of fasting. One of the customs, Chabad custom, on Sunday is called Lekach, is to ask from somebody else for a piece of honey cake. Honey cake. It's called Lekach. We ask, Bet Lekach. You ask the person, you can ask your, 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 your spouse, and, she, they can ask, and then she can ask you, or vice versa. In the, in the synagogue, the rabbi gives it out. Rabbi Chedebi used to give out lekach, and it's called the bet lekach. And the custom is that we do that, that we ask for lekach, so that should be the only thing we ask for this year, is this piece of honey cake. Everything else should be given to us for our, because we merit it, not because we need to beg for it. <laughs> there is a human, there is a custom to light a candle, to light like a day in the Shama, a day candle, a candle for those of your loved ones that are in heaven, as we're going to say, Yisker Anyam Kippur, 
So we light a candle for the neshama. So for example, I would like two candles, one for my mother, and one for my father. As the verse says, Kineid Hashem Nishmas Odom, the human soul is God's candle. And therefore their candle, the neshama, this candle, Hilamata, should light for them in heaven. We know that Yom Kippur, we say Yisker, because the neshama comes Lamata. The neshama comes down to the world on Yom Kippur. It comes down to the shul, or it comes down, if you, I'm in shul, if you're in shul, or come down to the shul. If you're in the house, it's going to come to the house. And when there's a candle, it is there for that neshama. It gives it light. There's also a Lebedic candle. There's a custom by Chabad that we light an, a candle for the living too. For the same reason. We're trying to bring light to our own neshama. Because our neshama, even as it's in our body, is also considered a candle. We know in Chasidut, why is the neshama considered to, uh, a candle? In Er Hashem, the human soul is God's candle. Because the neshama, God's, the, the candle flickers, always wants to go above. What holds it down is the wick and the oil. So too, the neshama always wants to go above. What holds it down is the body or the mitzvahs or it holds the neshama here in, in, here in this world. And that's why we, we light this candle. So you should get a candle, a day candle, a couple of candles, and we light this candle. As it's going to be down in the class in a, in a couple, in a, we'll soon see, that the journey of the day is the journey of the neshama. We should realize that the journey of Yom Kippur is the journey of our neshama from the way it's connected to the body to the way it reaches above the body. That's why according to Kabbalah, we have only on Yom Kippur five prayers. On a regular day, we have three prayers. On Shabbos, we have four prayers on the day. On Yom Kippur is the only day we say five prayers. And that is the Mayrib of Sunday night, the Shachris of Monday morning, the, min the, the Musav of Monday, the Mincha of Monday, and the Ila, which is the fifth prayer. And Chassidut explains, Kabbalah explains, that that is the journey. And you'll soon see a diagram. The nefesh, the five levels of the soul is nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, yechida. And I'll explain it soon in a moment. So this is the journey of the soul. It's like a ladder. The soul is journeying up a ladder that has five rungs. And it's slowly journeying with the body as the soul so shows the body the way it is connected to the body and the way the soul reaches ultimately Nila, which is the oneness of the soul, which is the way the soul is felt even above the body. And that's why it's really at the end of the day, we already fasted already close to 24 hours, 25 hours already. And we don't feel ourselves so much, but we suddenly at the Ila, we receive a rejuvenation. Everybody is rejuvenated by Mincha. They feel very tired. And suddenly by the Ila, everybody feels rejuvenated. They feel like they almost can fast another couple of hours. And the reason is because we're reaching to a higher level of the Neshama. We have reached to a level of the oneness of the soul that it's not so important to us, the guf. The guf actually receives its life force from the neshama, receives its life force from the soul itself. And that's why suddenly the guf, the body receives a rejuvenation. It rejuvenates itself. It feels like it has koyach from where? It, has no, it hasn't eaten. It hasn't had a drink, but it gets its rejuvenation from its soul itself. And that's a beautiful 
concept in, 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 in Kabbalah and Chassidus of the beauty of the prayers of, uh, of Yom Kippur as it starts on Sunday night and it ends this year on Monday night. Yom Kippur is a Shabbos. It's like a day of Shabbos. And as I said before, it's like Shabbos Shabbos. Therefore, we, we, we wear Shabbos clothes. We should wear Shabbos clothes. Not only we wear Shabbos clothes, but the, but the minute of Chabad and my many Jews, they wear a kittel on Yom Kippur. They wear a, 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 a garment that's white. So they're totally white. They're totally like, a, like angels. We're like angels. And it's one of the days that we bless our children or our grandchildren. We give them the, priest, the priestly blessings, which we all know. We come to show wearing our leather in our kittel, our white garment, and we put on a talus. Also something that we don't do a whole year, that we put the talus on. We make a bracha on the talus. We wear a talus. Everybody wears a talus. Some people, some Ashkenazi communities has a, have, a, have a minog, a custom to wear a talus. The chazan wear a talus, even by Myra. Chabad doesn't have that custom. But we all put on a talus. All males put on a talus for Myra of Yom Kippur. One of the beautiful prayers one of the differences between the prayers of, of, uh, of, uh, of Yom Kippur starting at night, and you'll do this whether you're at home or you're going to be in shul. The Shema Yisrael, we say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elekeinu, Hashem Echad. The next verse is, Baruch Shein Kavod Malchusay Le'elam Vod. Blessed be the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. And the custom is that that second paragraph, we say it, quietly. And there are many reasons that are given, but the main reason is that it's the prayer of the angels, a very powerful prayer that Moses heard when he was in heaven. He heard this is the way the angels praise God. Blessed be the name of your glory and kingdom forever and ever. And he gave this to the Jewish people, this prayer. And we put it, the sages put it in the Shema. But since it's the angel, it's a prayer of the angels, we say it quietly. The only time we say this paragraph out loud is on Yom Kippur, starting Sunday night. We say it out loud. Why? Because at this present time, we are all angels. We are forgiven. We trust that God is going to forgive us. And therefore, we say this prayer, this beautiful prayer out loud. As you know, that the beautiful, beautiful prayers in the Marsa. I hope you have a Marsa. If you're home, I'm sure you'll have a Marsa. Some beautiful prayers. And, and it's hard to do all the 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 the, the master, to keep up with the chazan of the community as they go through the master. But take some time and read a, a, at least a, one or two beautiful prayers of the master. And it's some of them are so beautiful, so meaningful, and they really talk to uh, to to the soul, and it, it brings out the beauty of 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 the yont of self understood. It's trying itself, the sages put together this masa these, and these beautiful poems and these beautiful prayers that would awaken up the heart to realize the power of the day. And Kippur is a powerful day because it's a day that the, 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 the Gemara, the Talmud says, it's the fast of the day itself brings kapara, brings forgiveness. Abish to gave us 24, 25 hours, which if we focused on a little bit, 
and we we realize the importance of that day, and we we and we make sure to accomplish or to to uh, to uh, uh, take the day and take the, the prayers of the day and elevate ourselves with the prayers. We would transform. We would have a different Yom Kippur. One of the beauties of Yom Kippur is based on the on, on the Kohen Gadol, on the service of the Kohen Gadol. It's, it's also part of the morning prayers in the Musa. It's called the Avoda. And now if you're home and you have a Masa, you surely have time to read through the Avoda in the Musa. I don't have a Masa here with me right now, but it's in the Avoda of the Musa. You have such beautiful, beautiful, truly a beautiful whole setup will give you the beauty of the day of what the Koyen Gadol, the high priest, did on Yom Kippur. And it's, 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 I have the, my wife just gave me the old Marza, but, uh, but it, it, it's, it's on page 178 in the old Marza. It's in the Avod, it's in the Musav of the Chazara Sashat. And it's really, truly a powerful part of the davening. And you should read it because you'll, you, by reading it, you'll get a picture of what Yom Kippur was in, in the base of Migdash. What was Yom Kippur in the Holy Temple? What was the service of the, of the Kohen Gadol? And everybody was in awe and everybody was focused on the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, of what he did on this day and what he accomplished on this day. And really, it's truly a beautiful, beautiful prayer. focus of Yom Kippur, the focus of Yom Kippur is on body and soul. We do on both things. Our soul is perfect. Our body is imperfect. Our soul is clean. Our body might come dirty. And therefore, we have to work to be able to connect to soul better. We need to cleanse the body. It's not the negative of the body. It's not the default of the body. It's not the default of the soul. It's the way the Abishta created the world, that there will be a physical and a spiritual side. The spiritual will always stay in its purity, and the physical will have the capability to become impure and become even dirty with sin. And we need to be able to work on Yom Kippur on both of these, on revealing the soul, and to be able to reveal the soul, we need to clean the body. We need to clean the physical. We don't need to get rid of the physical. As we said before, God doesn't want a person to suffer. God wants a person to cleanse himself. God wants a person to take his body and to be better vessel for the soul. And the more we can cleanse the body, the better the soul will have its revelation. And that's why we need to do vidui. That's why we need to ask God forgiveness. We have to do it in two, in many ways. We have to have thought of harata. We have to have a conscious thought of, of remorse, but we have to verbalize it because that's the way it's going to affect us physically if we're gonna verbalize it. That's why confession that we confess and this is not a confession you confess to anybody, but in your davening to God, you need to confess it with your mouth. Because that's the way it become, comes down into a physical cleansing. And the custom on Yom Kippur is also to bang yourself, to clap your heart. You don't have to zet it to hurt yourself. You got to just tap yourself. You got to feel it. You got to say al -chet. And we have all the al -chets all the sins that are in your siddha and every prayer starting from the Myers, actually starting from the Minicha service on Yom Kippur, from the Minicha service already on Yom Kippur, every Yom Kippur, and then the Meir service and every repetition of the Chazin, we're gonna say Al Chet over and over again. We say Al Chet, we say those confessions 10 times during Yom Kippur services, 10 times. 
And you might look at those, those all those confessions, al and you might say, oh, but what, what about the sins I have not done? There are sins here that I have not done. So should I take them out because I haven't done these sins? Why do I need to confess? Why must I tap myself? Why must I feel it, the tap if I haven't done that sin? If I didn't steal, you have an achet. Achet she katan the sin that I've done in gzela, I've stole. That's how you could say to yourself, honestly, I never stole a penny from anybody. I've never taken an extra dime from anybody. So why would I need to bang my heart and ask God's forgiveness for stealing if I never stole? And the answer that's given is there are many levels of stealing. There are many concepts of stealing. If you steal somebody's time, it's also stealing. If you steal somebody's faith, it's also stealing. If you steal somebody's emotion, that's also an act of stealing. It's a more delicate concept of stealing. So when I, talk, when I bang my heart, I say uh, on a sin of stealing, maybe I didn't steal somebody's money, but maybe I stole somebody's time. Maybe I stole somebody's thought. Maybe I stole somebody's feelings. He thought I meant something good and I didn't. He thought I thought he thought I was gonna I was gonna say hello to him. And, he, and, and, I, and I just walked by him. I heard him. I stole from him. And we say al chet. But Arizal writes, the Jewish people are one body. So that's because I didn't steal. There is a Jew out there might have stolen. So therefore, we are all in the pain of stealing, really. When a Jew sins, we are all need to cry, ask forgiveness. We need all because we are one entity. We are one body. It's like the, 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 uh, the marshal, the analogy that is given that the guy who drills a hole in the boat and, he, and, the, and the, his neighbor says, why are you drilling a hole in the boat? He says, this is my seat. I, mean, I could do what I want in my seat. He says, but if you drill a hole in the bottom of your seat, we're all gonna, gonna, gonna drown because it's one big boat. We are one big nation. And when you're when 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 you when somebody's when I do good, I do good for others, not only for myself. And if I sin, I automatically bring negative not only to myself, I bring negative to others. And therefore, our journey is on Yom Kippur. If you listen to the prayers, it's all about this to figure out a good connection, equilibrium between the body and the soul. I need to rectify the body. I need to elevate the soul. Therefore, Yom Kippur, on one hand, is a day of, of forgiveness, asking forgiveness. On the other hand, it's a yontiv. It's still a holiday. It brings forgiveness on its own. It's like Hoi Yom, the Gemara says, there's with no greater holidays by Jews, like Yom Kippur and Chamisha Asabav. So the Gemara calls, the Talmud calls Yom Kippur a holiday because it is a holiday. If the body is cleansed for the soul, it's the greatest gratification, it's the greatest holiday. That's why if you listen to the Avoda of Yom Kippur, you'll see that at the end of the Kippur was a great celebration. It's a great celebration. Thank God that we have accomplished this day that we have cleansed ourselves. We have purified ourselves. And now we can have a greater soul existence. We can have a greater power of the soul. And that's why, again, we need to do things that emphasize that we have a body and we have negative things and automatically the body is gonna bring about negative things and, and maybe not so positive things. But if we're gonna put, try to rectify the body, try to you know, put it in its right place and the body wants to be trained that's when the Abish the God created the body that it wants to be trained, then the soul can have its true elevation. And therefore, we confess. That's the beauty of what it is. Confession or chant and allowed. Some sins can be a nu nuisance. We confess for our collective selves. That's the beauty of this aspect. And as I said, if God forgives us, we confess our sins and God forgives something, you're not confessing to somebody else, you're confessing to God. 
we actually, in, in all synagogues, we sing. We sing the Ashamnim. The story that's told about Baal Shem Tev, that once he came to a city, and they came to him, the, the, the people of the city came to him and said, you need to talk to the Chazan. He's singing the Alchet. He's singing the Ashamnu in a song. Ashamnu is that we are, we are we're bad. Why would you sing we're bad, we're, we're not good people in a song? You should, should sing it in a morbid song, not in a happy song. So the Baal Shem Tev called the Chazan. And he said, why are you singing this in a very happy song? He says, Debe. He says, listen, I feel like I'm on Yom Kippur. I'm in the king's palace. I'm the chazan. I'm in the king's palace. There are the ministers. There are the biknakers. And then there are the cleaners, the ones that clean the garbage of the palace. Should the guy who's cleaning the garbage in the palace feel sad? that he's cleaning the garbage of the palace. No, we should be happy. The palace is going to look beautiful. The king is going to be able to walk through the palace, a clean palace, because I'm cleaning it. We Jews are coming on Yom Kippur. We're cleaning the palace. We're cleaning God's palace. What is God's palace? That's ourselves. We're cleaning God's palace. That's our body. Is the palace that, that houses the soul. So should we be sad that we are cleaning the palace? We should be happy. We're cleaning the palace. So now the soul is not rummaging through dirt. The soul is in a clean body. So why wouldn't you be happy? One of the holiest, as I mentioned to you before, in Kippur, this, as I said, you should look into the Avoda, the, uh, the service in, the, in, in the Musaf. The most, uh, the most, uh, it was all about the Beis HaMikdash. And the truth is, that's why we Jews beg for the coming of Mashiach. So that we'll be able to be in the Beis HaMikdash. We'll be able to do the service in the Beis HaMikdash. One of the beautiful poems, one of the beautiful songs, it says, there's a song here, Mare Koyen, that when the Jewish people went through the service in the temple and the Koyen God will finish the service, it was a great celebration in the Beis HaMikdash. One of the things that happened in the temple was in the altar, the outside altar, was a red string around the altar. And in Kippur happened a miracle that after the service, this red string Crimson string turned white. Can you imagine seeing this on the day of Yom Kippur that you knew that you were forgiven? On the day of Yom Kippur, only on Yom Kippur, the Gemara says the doors of the temple were opened and the Jewish people had a chance to see all the way into the Holy of Holies. Something that they couldn't do any other day of the year. This was a very special day. This was a day that you were not obligated to come to the temple. It was not Sukkot, where you were obligated to come to the temple. Here Jews came to the temple because they wanted to find connection to God. They wanted to have kapara. They wanted to have forgiveness. That's one of the reasons why we say Yisker on this day, because this connection continues also to heaven. As my soul, because I'm yearning for my soul's connection on Yom Kippur, the souls of my parents are also yearning that connection in heaven. That yearning does not end after the soul leaves the body. That yearning actually comes deeper as the soul is in heaven. Therefore, that's one of the reasons we say your Yisker on Yom Kippur. All Jews say Yisker on Yom Kippur. Because we mentioned that David should remember the souls, its journey. Not only should we remember the souls, its journey here in this world and give us life. And you should be a Shoshani, you can say, we should sign for a year of life. But the Shom is that in heaven. My parents' souls, my grandparents' souls, my great-grandparents' souls. 
they should also have on this day an elevation, a revelation. Their yearnings should be accomplished. Their connections should be accomplished on this day, like my connections and my yearnings should be accomplished on this day. Because the truth is my soul journey is their soul's journey and their soul's journey is connected to my soul's journey. So this is the Avoida that I mentioned. All these took place when the sanctuary was on its foundation. The Holy of Holies was on its basis. And the Kayan God who stood and performed the temple service, his generation saw it and they rejoiced. This is one of the, one of the statements in the Mahzer. When you saw Mare Koyin, when you saw the Koyin Gadol in his service, when you saw the service of Yom Kippur, it was something to be held. It was something to be seen. One of the Avtoiris of Yom Kippur is the story of Jonah and Mincha. The story of Jonah, the famous story of Jonah and he was uh, the prophet who God asked to go to Nineveh and ultimately uh, try to run away and uh, was swallowed by a fish and was thrown out of the fish and ultimately went to Nineveh and they did shuva. And the lessons of that story is we cannot flee from God, so wherever we go, he's already there. We cannot ignore our sins. If we don't repent for them, we will be punished. That was, that was the story of Nineveh. Repentance cannot cancel a terrible decree. If God forgave a non-Jewish people, repentance cannot cancel a terrible decree. If God forgave a non-Jewish people of Nineveh, he can certainly forgive his children. And that's again to emphasize the importance of tshuva, the aspect of importance of tshuva. In Milcha service, we say two expressions. Bring us back to you, God, and, and, we will and we will return. Or we can say, bring us to you, God, and we will return. Return to me, and I shall return to you. There's two ways of looking at this. And we ask God, we ask, God says, I'm waiting for you to return, and then I'll return to you. No, we say to God, you first return to us. Come to us and we'll return to you. Here are the five levels of the soul. Nefesh, Ruach, Nishama, Chaya, Yechida. This is the five, the five long, long ladder that I spoke to you about before. Nefesh is Mayriv. The beginning of our service on Sunday night is Nefesh. First beginning to emphasize our action. The morning service is the Ruach, the emotions of the Neshama, the Shema is in there. The Musaf is the Neshama, the intellect of the Neshama. The Mincha is the Chaya of the soul, the will of the soul. And the Ne'ila is the oneness of the soul. That's when the soul is united totally with, with God and with the body. They become as one entity. And those, this is the five serve the five, the five prayers are the journey of the Nashama, the five levels of this of my soul. So that's why once it comes to Nila. As I said before, I'm totally rejuvenated. And that's why we don't mention any sins. We don't do our chet in nila. We are done. It's finished. When Yechidah Sheba Nefesh, the oneness of the soul, is there's no aspect of negativity in the oneness of the soul. So in all the other prayers, starting from Mayrev and Shachas and Musav and Mincha, we do our chet. We ask God forgiveness and we have confessions. Not in the ilah. The ilah is 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 the is the is the oneness of the nasham. People are afraid of nila.
if you are on the inside of the gate, so what's wrong with the gate closes? If the gate closes, you're on the inside, so you're closed inside. You have to worry about if you're on the outside. But my friends, if they're going through Yom Kippur, if they're being, whether you're going to be home or you're going to be in show, and you're going to fast, and you're going to try your best, do the prayers to the best of your ability, are we all going to be on the outside? We're all going to be on the inside. We're all going to be on the, on the right side of the fence. So what are we afraid of, Neva? What are we frightened? We should be happy. God closed the fence and we're on the inside at that time. And that's the beauty of Ni'ila. <coughs> at the end of Ni'ila, we say, one time the Chazan says, Shema, you can do this at home. Also, I want to tell you, you can do Yisker at home. If you're going to be home, you should do the Yisker. Here, O Israel, we say one time, here, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Then we say three times, blessed be his name, and glorious kingdom forever and ever. And then we said, we say, Hashem Hu Elikim, God is our Lord, seven times. If you're going to look in your Machzer, when it says before the Shema Yisrael, before you say the Shema Yisrael, it says that Hashallah was a great Kabbalist, a great sage. Lived in Tzfat. He said, when you say by Ni'ilah the Shema Yisrael, you just scream it out loud. And you should have great kavanah, you should have great intentions in your heart that you're ready to go on self-sacrifice. We know Jews throughout history went on self-sacrifice with the, with the statement of Shema Yisrael. Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That should be our self-sacrifice. We come to Ni'ila, the last prayer, and we say the Shema Yisrael. We should scream it out loud, and we should feel as if we are ready to go on self-sacrifice. The intention will be considered, and the Shalom writes, the intention will be considered for him as if he has indeed done so, and as if he has actually withstood the test to sanctify the divine name. So it's a very powerful time. It's at the end of Nila. It's right before the blowing. We're going to say the Kaddish. We're going to blow the shofar. And we're all going to sing, scream out, the Shana Ba for Yerushalayim in the year to come. Yerushalayim. One of the reasons why we blow the shofar, to, not, to notify the people that the nightfall has occurred, the fast is over. To raise a sounding of trumpets similar to the armies who return from a victory by the sounding a trumpet and a horn, we are victorious to proclaim that this night is regarded as a holiday and that we'll celebrate it with a lavish meal and a hearty heart. And that's why there's a custom that after uh, we finished uh, Yom Kippur, after the fast, you should have a Sudas Yontif, you should have a festival meal, and you should go right away and start to build your sukkah or do you have some connection with the holiday of sukkahs, which is called Zman Sim a holiday of great joy and happiness. And that's the journey. And Amir Shem, next week, we're going to have on Wednesday, next, next Tuesday night, we're going to have a class on sukkahs. But until then, I wish you a Gemach Sima Teva. May you all be maybe may we all be signed for a happy and healthy and beautiful year, a year of greatness for each and every one of us, a year of greatness for the Jewish nation, a year of greatness for the world, a year of com the coming of Mashiach, Bimheda, Biyameno Mamish. I wish you only the best. Have an easy and a meaningful Shabbos. Shabbos Shuva the Shabbos is called the Shabbos of Repentance. And, and have an easy and meaningful fast. Tomorrow night. We're having again tomorrow night at 8 p.m. We're having again an unbelievable program with my brother-in-law and Rabbi Shimon, Shimon Jacobson. He's going to be a Yom Kippur service. You're going to be, you're gonna, they're going to blow your mind away.
So have a wonderful evening. If anybody has a question, you can ask. Anybody have a question?